the history of the development of jet engines. Jet propulsion. Did you know that a squid is a jet propelled animal? A squid pulls in water and then forces it out a different orifice, O-R-I-F-I-C-E, a different orifice and that water that it blows out its propulsion orifice, I don't know the exact term, if anybody needs an extra credit project let me know, and that water comes out of the tailpipe if you will at a faster velocity than it did before. The force uh, exerted on that water and moving in one direction is equal to the force pushing the squid forward in the opposite direction. You probably don't remember, but here's a physics review. Newton's, excuse me, third law of motion is every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So whatever force we apply to air going through a jet engine, the equal but opposite force will be applied to the engine. So the engine, if we blow air aft, then the engine will get pushed forward and hopefully the engine is attached to the airplane and it will pull the airplane with it. There are essentially two methods of developing thrust with a jet propulsion engine. And we'll talk about in the next chapter, there's different types of jet propulsion engines. There's liquid rockets, solid rockets, ramjets, pulse jets, and of course, the turbine engine, which is what we usually refer to as jet engines. They're all jet propulsion engines. So when, if somebody says a rocket jet, they're actually being accurate. It is a jet nozzle. It's just not a turbine engine that's producing the gases. It's a rocket engine that's producing the gases. And the font on this computer didn't do what I wanted it to. So I've got to write this in here. So this is delta. This is change. One way, one of the two methods of developing thrust is by taking a mass of air and accelerating it. This formula right here, mass times change in, f in velocity, is the same as the mass times acceleration. When later on, when we get into uh, looking at jet engines specifically, the force due to acceleration, mass is the weight of the air divided by acceleration due to gravity, which is 32.2 .2 feet per second squared. We're going to stay in uh, feet, pounds. We're not going to use newtons and do the metric thing. So this is the mass right here. This part right here, that's the mass and then we're going to multiply it times the change in velocity. So we're going to multiply that by the second velocity of the engine, that's exiting the engine, subtracted from the velocity entering the engine, the first velocity. So if we had a jet engine, and you don't have to draw this right now, we'll be drawing stick diagrams of jet engines a lot, and we pull air in at velocity number one, we're going to blow air out the exhaust at velocity number two and how much mass and we're going to do we're going to do things in seconds so this weight here is going to be in how many pounds per second is going through here if we multiply it by the difference in these two velocities then we're going to be able to tell how much force this engine is supplying based on this change in velocity uh, of a certain mass of air Now, the second way, occurring simultaneously, it's not like it's one or the other, it's both simultaneously. F is for force. Force applied by the engine is equal to the area of the jet nozzle times the change in pressure. This is delta P, change in pressure. Another way to write that would be area of the jet nozzle, that's the exhaust, times this change in pressure. Pressure leaving the jet nozzle subtracted, uh, subtract from it pressure ambient. So again, if we have a jet engine, and my stick diagrams with this tablet is not that great, if we have a jet engine, and we're pulling in air, this is pressure ambient. In fact, you know, I'm going to get rid of that. There we go. Pressure ambient is in the front of the engine. The airflow is this direction. Here's the exhaust. And 
air is going out the tailpipe. If we measured the pressure in here, pressure in the jet, we need higher pressure in the tailpipe than we do out in front. So for instance, out here ambient on a standard 8 CO, that's 14.73 pounds per square inch. If here in the tailpipe we have say 29, whoops, I say here in the tailpipe we have 29 PSI, then the, and the area of the jet nozzle here is a couple of square feet, let's say it's two square feet, times pressure in the jet nozzle is 29 minus 14.73. That's essentially going to be 2 times 14 equals, let's see if I can do this, 28 pounds per square, whoops, 28 pounds of force. Okay, I can dig it. In any case, don't worry about the math right now. I'm happy if you could describe the fact that the two ways to develop thrust on a jet engine are one, uh, force equals mass times change in velocity, and force equals and, that is, and the force is also ad added to that is the area of the jet nozzle or the exhaust pipe times the change in pressure from the outside air pressure to the inside of the jet engine. And of course, you know, write the formulas down. Okay, development of jet engines. The first recorded uh, example of a jet propulsion device was Hero's Eolipile. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, Eolipile. And here's a picture of it. And, we're to, and you don't have to remember the dates. If you want to, you can cross out this first century AD. I'm not going to ask you the dates on any of these. But if we've got some water in here and it produces steam up, comes up into here, and it can, you know, it can spin around. There's a couple of jet nozzles, and the pressure on the inside of here is higher than that on the outside, so we have differential pressure, and the velocity is higher than. Well, actually, the velocity of this thing is. Uh, I guess it's not zero as it starts to spin around. It'll have some velocity. But if we have velocity one and coming out here is velocity two, then we have a jet propulsion device. The, the story goes, it's not a story, it's, this happened. They, they, this guy built this thing in Egypt a long time ago. Uh, Chinese rockets, of course, certainly did occur. And depending on what, uh, what source you want to read? Chinese rockets were first mass produced around around the, in the 1200s, um, and they were a jet propulsion device. And there was a bunch of them. It's not like somebody built just one; they built a lot. So there's, of course, a completely different type of jet propulsion device. I mean, hey, now we're not talking squid and octopi. We're talking, you know, a solid rocket-fueled engine versus a steam jet. I personally like Leonardo da Vinci, um, and one of the things I like about him, besides trying to design flying machines and parachutes and stuff, is he is designed a thing called the chimney jack, and essentially this was the first turbine that actually made something spin. Here we, of course, have uh, a roast pig, which by the end of this class, you know, you'll be writing uh, Mr. Johnson on this thing right down here. But this is just a fan, except instead of adding energy to the air, the hot gases, let's see, let's try a different color here. The hot gases coming off of the flame go through this fan and make the fan spin. So this fan is actually a turbine. It's actually extracting energy out of the air that's going through it. And this energy goes through the shaft, spins this gear, this gear spins this gear, goes into this shaft, goes around this belt, and rotates the spit that the pig is on. Sweet! My my idea of a good barbecue, well, actually, any barbecue with roast pig in it's pretty good. But... Um, I like this because it's the first time somebody took a had a turbine that had gases going through it that accomplished something. Whoops, was that all of them? Yeah, I guess it was. Okay. 
Wan Hu or Wan Hu. I I watched the the Mythbusters and they called it Wan Hu. In any case, this is a legend. Uh, it's 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 it, there's no documentation. Nobody's willing. No historian's willing to say this happened for sure. Like Hero's Iliopile. But I like it because it was the first attempt at jet propelled flight. Somebody tried, or theoretically, or maybe, or the story is, somebody tried to fly back in the 1500s with a jet propulsion device. Here's a picture that somebody drew. 47 rockets is the story. 47 guys lit the, the, uh, the fuses. Um, here's another different picture. Another story of it is that he hooked himself in his chair and his 47 rockets up to a kite. Uh, but in both stories, uh, the rockets blew up. And so he died. So kind of a bummer. But hey, you know, uh, if he'd gotten off the ground, he didn't have any flight controls. He didn't have seat belts. You know, he didn't have a type rating to fly this rocket plane, so I think there would have been some issues, although I guess there wasn't any Chinese FAA back then to get him in trouble. But, hey, somebody was thinking about flying with a jet-propelled device. That's pretty sweet. Newton, you know, that Isaac Newton, Apple Hellot fell on his head, Newton's third law of motion guy. He actually wrote down a design. Uh, it's guessed that this was never built. And if it had, the amount of jet propulsion on this unit would not have been enough to overcome the friction on the ground. But you run a little fire down at the bottom. You, you got water in here. You get steam coming out at nozzle. So here's our jet nozzle. If we can get a higher velocity here, whoops. I'm hitting the buttons. If we can get a higher velocity here, then the forward velocity of the device will get thrust that way. And if the pressure inside the jet nozzle, pressure in the jet is higher than pressure ambient out in front of the jet nozzle, then we'll get thrust that way. Uh, this would have worked in that it would have developed thrust, but probably not enough to make this thing work very well. Okay, finally, somebody does it. This guy named Opel. If you ever heard of Opel cars, it's the same guy. Germany, late 1920s, he flew a rocket plane. Now, granted, you could argue, oh, man, it's not a rocket plane, that's a glider. Yes, it's true, it was a glider. But he flew it. He put a bunch of rockets in the back here. There's a whole bunch of rockets back here, like five or six or ten solid rockets. Just This this is Wan Hu of the 20th century, man, except he had some technology. Somebody already knew how to fly. Uh, you got to remember World War One, the Versailles Treaty told Germany you don't get to fly any powered airplanes, so gliding and soaring was really big in Germany after World War One and uh, Opel put some rockets on cars and he thought that was way cool and he's like alright let's put some rockets on a plane so they built a glider put rockets on it and it flew pretty sweet first time somebody f actually flew in a jet propelled device jet propelled aircraft Okay, we'll get into some more details here shortly, but jet engines, well, I guess I'm going to get into them now. Jet engines were being developed in Germany and in Great Britain, in England, during the 1930s. Uh, in Great Britain, it was Frank Whittle. He ended up getting knighted later, so he's Sir Frank Whittle. And Hans von Ohain, he was in Germany in the 1930s. His engine actually flew first. He designed one engine and then uh, actually ran on hydrogen and he was working for Heinkel, an airframe manufacturer, and because he didn't think any of the engine manufacturers would go for it, and he knew that Heinkel, the guy running the company, was really into speed. He felt the need, the need for speed, I guess. In any case, uh, and of course in Germany during the 1930s, the government was spending lots and lots of money on machines of war, including lots and lots of airplanes. So, he had better funding than Frank Whittle did in Great Britain during the 30s. He built a prototype, it ran, he designed a better engine, a bigger engine, and they built it and put it into the Heinkel HE-178 in 1939. And here's a picture of it, here's another picture of it. The HE-178, one person, the thing, the engine had about a thousand pounds of thrust and it went about 400 miles an hour, like I said earlier. Wow, first jet airplane, first turbine powered airplane ever and it goes 400 miles an hour. There was only a few airplanes at that time that would do better than 400 
and, you know, like a P-51. I don't know. I don't know if they had P-51s in 39. In any case, that was pretty darn good. Um, two years later, Sir Frank Whittle's engine, he designed one and then designed a better one, a bigger one. He put it in an airplane, the uh, Gloucester E-28-39, and that airplane went about 400 miles an hour on a 1,000 pound thrust engine. I found that it was very interesting that both engines had extremely similar designs, similar weights, and the airplanes they put them in had similar speeds. Okay, interestingly enough, uh, Henkel and Hans von Ohain didn't get the contract to mass produce a jet engine or an airplane. Uh, von Ohain designed a third engine I don't know if he designed a third engine or whether it was this same engine just improved. And they put it in a two-engine fighter plane uh, and flew it, but the German government at the time selected Messerschmitt to build an airplane, and another guy, Ans Amsel, shucks, I'll have to remember his name, Franz was his last name, uh, he built an engine, uh, Junkers, the Junkers UMO 004, and they put it in the Messerschmitt 262. Here's a picture. Here's another picture. I think this is a pretty cool picture. One engine on each wing. Here, I'll show you that picture again. Okay. Uh, one engine on each wing. This thing went 500 miles an hour. 500 miles an hour. Sweet. It was faster by nearly 100 miles. It was faster by 100 miles an hour than almost everything. A couple of hundred miles, 250 miles faster an hour than the B-17s and B-24 bombers coming into Germany. And close to 100 miles an hour faster even than a P-51 or a P-47. It was the fastest thing cooking. What a deal. Now downsides, the UMO 004, uh, did not last very long in that you had to overhaul it. The first engines, you had to overhaul them every 50 hours. Ah! But they made quite a few of them. Uh, there's a lot of stories surrounding if that airplane had been used for air-to-air -air instead of ground attack. Hitler dis was worried because in the 40s, uh, this was prototype flew in 42, not went into mass production. So by the time these things were in mass production, Germany was being invaded. You know, this Pad Day was passed. And uh, the Allies were moving in, literally in Germany, so he told the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, to use the Messerschmitt 262s for ground attack instead of sh show shooting up, up the bombers. And so the bombers kept coming, and uh, that's one of the reasons why the Germans ended up losing World War II. Well, it would have been interesting if, the, if they had built more ME 262s and used them to shoot down the bombers instead of for ground attack. Would that have prolonged the war or even changed the course of the war? Sounds like a good science fiction book to me. The UMO 004 was the engine that got put in the Messerschmitt ME 262, so it was the first mass-produced turbine engine. Turbine engine. Here's a cutaway. We'll look more at that some other time. Here's another cutaway in a museum. I don't know where this museum is from. It's a reasonably simple jet engine. Interestingly enough, it's actually a jet engine in the front uh, that starts up the engine. So you actually pulled it like a like a lawnmower. You'd yank it with a cord to get that get jet engine or gasoline engine started, and that would fire up the engine. And there's another picture of the UMO 004 as if it was cut away. The Vickers Viscount. Vickers is a British company. Uh, they still make a lot of airplane parts like fuel controls and pumps, hydraulic pumps, fuel pumps. They make a lot of stuff. But back then they were an airframe manufacturer and they made the first turbine, the first turboprop that went into service. It went into service in 1950. No, you don't have to know the year. It was the first turboprop that went into service. Here's a picture of it. Dig the round, dig, dig the oval doors, man. Totally awesome, man. And of course, the oval windows. Four Rolls Royce Dart engines. If you've ever heard of a Grumman Gulfstream 1, you've probably heard of a G4, G5 business jet. Well, the G1 was a turboprop made in the United States, but those G1s had one Rolls Royce Dart engine on each wing. This one has uh, four Rolls Royce Dart engines on it. Here's another picture of a newer model. The doors aren't oval, but the windows still are. This is a slightly larger version of it. And, of course, everybody knows about the de Havilland Comet. It went into service. It was the first turbojet. It went into service in 1952. 
And there's, you know, if you've done anything into aviation safety, you've probably heard of the Comet. They made square windows. Do I have a better picture of it? Yeah, that doesn't show the square windows very well. But they had squarish windows, and pressurizing, depressurizing, the stress would form at the corners of the windows because they weren't round. And they ended up having uh, cracks coming off of the windows, and the fuselage came in, uh, apart in flight. I hate it when the fuselage comes apart in flight. And at least a couple of them were destroyed over the ocean, and uh, <laughs> nobody wanted to fly airplanes that they didn't even know why. It took them a couple, three, four years to figure out why they were cracking up. And by then, people were like, comments, eh, I don't think so. And of course, the 707 went into, into uh, service in 1958, and uh, ended up taking off, and of course the DC-8 by McDonnell Douglas and Convair made some big four-engine jobs too. There's another picture. You know the engines. The engines are probably right in here, at the back, two in each wing. This airplane, it went 500 miles an hour. 500 miles an hour. That was a solid twice as fast as the 250 mile an hour piston engine jobs that it was replacing twice as fast went from 250 to 500 miles an hour huge huge leap and then of course the next uh, the next airplane I have on the list is the Tupolev TU-144 it was the first supersonic passenger jet to go into service it went into service in 1976 it was only in service for about six months they took one of these to the Paris Air Show and it crashed at the Paris Air Show somebody can find me a video of that I think we could talk some extra credit contact me first before you go looking for that video I would love to see that thing crash. Well, okay, I didn't mean it in a negative way. In any case, it was only in service for six months, but it was in service carrying passengers before the Concorde. The Concorde actually went into service the same year, 1976, but it was after the TU-144 went into service. And here's a little more details about Frank. Frank Whittle, he was in graduate school in 1928. He was a pilot in the the English Air Force. He was also trained in school as an engineer, and they I don't know if they sent him or he went, how he went back to graduate school, but he's working on his master's degree. And he wrote a th his thesis for his master's degree was about using a turbine engine, a gas turbine engine. Uh, that's gas turbine instead of a water turbine, you know, like a water wheel sitting on the side of, uh, you know, a stream. A gas turbine be used for aircraft propulsion and he figured out or at least he thought you know what if we don't have that propeller we could go supersonic speeds if we have a really good compressor in that engine we could go really really high altitudes even when the air is thin and we could use that gas turbine engine to drive a fan like now nobody even makes turbo jets we just fly big turbo fans and you could use it to drive a propeller and so he wrote that thesis in 28, and then through the 1930s, some people got together, formed a company called Power Jets Limited, because he went to the government, you know, the British Air Force, and they said, nah, we don't want to spend any money. Got some private investors together, built his first engine, and here's a picture of it, it's in the book too, built his first jet engine, and it worked. And then they started getting interest, you know, and it started things started warming up in Europe, and it's like, okay, fine, we'll give you some more money. And he built a second engine, and this is the engine that actually went in the Gloucester E28/39 that put out about a thousand pounds of thrust, and the airplane went about 400 miles an hour. These these gizmos right here, these are the combustion chambers. There's a bunch of combustion chambers, and this is the exhaust pipe. Interestingly enough, the compressed air comes down across the combustion chamber and is accelerated aft. It's a reverse flow uh, combustion chamber. We'll get into that when we get into combustion chambers. And here's a picture. What I find really weird is that Frank Whittle, and, uh, and of course, just so you know, this is a calculator right here. This is a pre-electric calculator. It's called a slide rule. He looks like Adolf Hitler, but he's not. He's Frank Whittle, Great Britain, invented jet engines in the 1930s. Then there was Hans, Hans von Ohain. Han was in Germany. I told you about him, his first engine. I think I got a picture here in a second. He actually took out a patent in Germany in 1936. He got funding faster because he was working for Henkel. Heinkel? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. And he got a, his prototype built and worked and made a better engine and got his airplane to fly first. Here's a picture of him back in the good old days. 
And here's a picture of him with next to his, I don't know if that's him, but that is a picture of his first engine ran on hydrogen. Pretty funky looking. And then here's a picture of the engine that actually went, the first jet engine to ever fly. It went on the uh, Heinkel HE-178. Uh, decades later, uh, aviation people all over the world looked into it and figured out that neither Frank Whittle nor Hans von Ohain knew what the other guy was doing in the 1930s. So they are now credited with both simultaneously but independently developing the turbine engine. Whoops. If you have any questions about the history of the development of turbine engines, jet engines, please send me an email, give me a call as, as required.